we began talking about prayer, last week I taught you how to pray, and I taught you why you should pray. If that's something that you didn't catch or you didn't hear, then please go back and, and watch that message. Go to our, our YouTube page, uh, check that out. It's three reasons why you should pray. If you get lost, why am I doing this? Well, here, here they are. And then it's seven elements to prayer. And it takes the Lord's Prayer and kind of just breaks that down for you. So you can sit down with like almost like a checklist. And when you get through that, you've prayed for everything and over everything in your life. But, that, but I, do that because that's you and God. That's you speaking with God, God speaking to you. You understanding that when you speak to God, He listens, He responds but then the second part to that, that I wanted for us to talk about, I think we need this. I, I think we need it. I, I think that there's significance and there's power when we learn how to pray and we learn how to talk to God. But sometimes I'm a little tired and I need somebody to pray with me. Sometimes my soul is a little worn out and I need some people behind me helping me. Sometimes it's not enough for me just to pray and talk to God. Sometimes I need my friends, family, I need my crew. I've got a couple guys, a couple other pastors that I reach out to, we pray together, and sometimes I need that. So it's great that me and God have got a good thing going, but it's also even better that me and some other people in my life have got a thing going. So here, when I look out in this room here, you know, I see a thousand people out here. That's for our online people. You know, I see a thousand of you out here. It's amazing that you've come, you know. And but when I see, I, I look at you guys, I see potential. Too many of us are doing too much of life alone and too many of us all of us we need to start doing some more life together and a big thing that we can do together is we can pray and in fact I want to give you today's big idea before we even get going into the message today it, it, we're going to talk about get out of jail kind of prayers and then our big idea where two or more pray together okay so if I can count I know there's more than two people I know there's more than just me in this room, unless this is an amazing dream, but yeah, if it's a dream, I want ice cream. No, nope, it's real. So, where two or more pray together, God hears and responds. Why? Here's the question that's bothered me this week. Bothered in a good way. Why would we not pray together? If God responds when two or more people are gathered, then why would we not have a dedicated time in our diary every single day where we get together with each other and we pray. I, and I'm not, I don't do that, but why not? Well, I, I think a lot of it is I don't quite have an understanding of the significance and the power of corporate prayer, praying together or, or praying with people. And also, you have personalities, you've got, you know, are you introverted, are you extroverted? You know, there's all these kind of things that go into it, but today is a reminder for all of you and for me for us, that there is a significant, significant power when we come together and we pray together. So we're going to adventure through prayer today by looking at, at a, a character, a guy named Peter. Now, I call these stories and characters, but these are real events with real people. And we're going to be looking at uh, this story where Peter finds himself in prison. But before we go into that, I want to explain a little bit of the background for you so that you have a better understanding of what's going on. So it starts with a guy named Herod. Now Herod comes from four generations of evil. And that word evil, that's a strong word, but I mean it. So you've got four Herods here. Herod number one, Herod the Great. These go in chronological order. So the oldest, Herod the Great... This is the guy that had all the baby boys two years and under killed when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That's, that's how bad of a dude that he was. And then next in line, you had Herod Antipas. And this is the guy that was a part of, uh, or this is the guy that made the decision to cut John the Baptist's head off. Because he wanted to marry his sister, or his stepsister. I, I can't uh, remember that at the moment. But he wanted to do something that he shouldn't do. John the Baptist had spoken out against him. And he ended up beheading John the Baptist for a couple other reasons as well. But he was also a part of Jesus' trial. Again, a bad guy. A bad dude here. And then Herod Agrippa I, that's who we're talking about today. But then after him, Herod Agrippa II... He would be a king that would be one of Paul's judges. And so this is not a good family 
lineage. It's not a good group of people. But to tell you a little bit more about Herod Agrippa I, that's our guy that we're talking about today. So if you're a part of this adventure, if you're in this prayer adventure, then this is the guy that is the king that we are serving under. And he was in kind of a a unique position in that he had two groups of people that he had to make happy. He had to make the Romans happy, and then he had to make the Jewish people, uh, their entire culture, their entire population, he had to make them happy. So the Romans put him in power, but he had this expectation that he would keep peace between both groups. And Herod was uniquely equipped to do this because his mom was Jewish. And so he's got to make both groups happy. And I think it was probably easier for him to make the Romans happy, and maybe a little bit more difficult to make the Jewish people happy, because something happens, and Herod realizes that he's got this really unique and significant opportunity. In fact, it's an unexpected opportunity that Herod gets. He gets this opportunity to gain new favor with the Jewish people, because it was being created by this thing called the Christian movement. And so some people say that this is called the way. Uh, But for our purposes here, Jesus has died on the cross, and then he has resurrected and gone to heaven. And after that, the disciples, they go out, they've been sent out, they go out, and they start making disciples. They start telling other people about Christ. And as that begins to happen, more and more people start leaving the Jewish faith. They start leaving the temple system. They leave their culture. They start... Walking away from that. And the Jews are like, we don't like this. We don't want this to happen. It's the, profes- the people that were professional at knowing God the best were upset because people were leaving to follow God's son. And they were really unhappy about this. And Herod says, hey, I can do something about this. If I, if I do something about all these people that are upsetting the Jews, then I will have more stability with the Jews. I'll have more favor with them. So he takes advantage of this. So Herod goes out, and we're in Acts chapter 12 today. And in Acts chapter 12, Herod goes out, and he decides, I'm going to round up some of these guys, and I'm going to arrest them. So now at that time, so this is during the time of uh, Agrippa I, Herod, he was the king of the Jews. He arrested some who belonged to the church. So that's how we know that these are those that are following after Jesus. They're following the way. They're following this, uh, this gospel movement here. And so he arrests them. He's intending to harm them. He didn't arrest them to have tea. You know, he said, I'm going I'm to do damage to these guys here. And then he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. So don't, let's not glaze over this. Arrested, put to death. That's immediate. He has them arrested. He has James put to death. And when it says that he's put to death by the sword, that's, that's a beheading. So it, it was, James was rounded up, arrested, and beheaded. And James was the first martyr after Jesus resurrected. He was the first of the 12 disciples uh, that would be martyred for the sake of Christ. Now James and Peter and John who all play a a role in this story today, they were Jesus' inner three. They had argued with each other and said, Jesus, which one of us is going to sit at your right hand in the throne? Which means they're saying, which one of us is going to have the position of honor, the more special place in heaven with you? And Jesus says, okay, you want to share in my glory, but actually first you're going to share in my suffering. And they're like, okay, cool. We get to share in the glory and a little bit of suffering over here. And James, he shares in the suffering of Christ. And that it was through that suffering that he enters the the glory with Christ. But James is the first to have his life pay the price for following after this gospel message, following after Jesus. So let's let's move on here. So Herod sees that the Jews are really happy about what happened. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to have Peter arrested as well. And this was during the days of unleavened bread, the Passover week. So there's a lot packed into this here. Uh, I've got a saying that I like to use that sometimes is good, sometimes is bad. But if a little bit is good, more is better. Right? If a little bit of ice cream is good, more is better. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. If a little bit of drugs are good, more is better. Right? No. We say say no to that. Just making sure you guys are understanding here. But I've got this... um, 
this, this idea here that Herod actually is adopting. So Herod says, if a little bit of good appease to the Jews, then more is going to be better. So when I noticed that when I got rid of James, the Jews were happier, so let me do more. And so then he has Peter brought in to do this exact same thing, but he can't do it immediately because he can't have Peter murdered because they're in the middle of a religious event, which is, is for me is mind-boggling. It's a bit baffling here. So they're in the middle of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's a Passover week. So Peter is put in prison for a week. James is brought in, immediately beheaded. Peter brought in, spends seven days in prison because they're busy being holy, and so they can't behead him until after they're finished with the, with the holy week. I just The irony that's in there is like, you know, you're following God's son, you know, but anyway, so they, they can't. So Peter spends seven days. He's going to spend a week in prison. And when he had seized Peter, so in verse 4, when he had seized Peter, he put him in prison, and he turned him over to four squads of soldiers, of four each, to guard him. And they rotated throughout the night. And so this is a group of four, and then a group of four, and a group of four, and a group of four. Two of them would be chained to Peter, and the other two would stand guard and would stand on lookout. How valuable is Peter to Herod? Unbelievably valuable. He is not going to take chances. If some is good, more is better. James was good. Peter, that's going to be the golden goose there. That's going to be the one that really gets me uh, in with the Jews. You know, Peter had been commissioned by Christ to go out and to take the gospel to the Jewish people. And so we're going to take that guy. Herod's going to deliver him and his head over to the Jews. That's the golden goose. But he's got to wait a week in order for that to happen. So he's got four sets of four soldiers that are going to guard him to make sure that nothing happens there. And so he's planning after the Passover to bring him out before the people for execution. So we know Peter's destiny. Peter is destined for death. That's his destiny. And so in verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison. But here's two words, these two beautiful words here. Fervent and persistent prayer for him was being made to God by the church. So here's the first time that we introduce this corporate prayer into, this, uh, into the, the history of this event here. So they were praying fervently and persistently. They'd gotten together. What, what that means, before I even move on, is a group of people that called themselves the church. The church is not the building. The church is the people. So a group of people have gathered, and they're praying for Peter. And there's urgency to this prayer because they know that James has had his head cut off. And they know what's coming for Peter. This was setting a precedent which had not been set before because James was the first to lose his life, the first of the disciples. Now all of a sudden, those that were following the way, that were following Christ, they know, okay, our days are numbered. If this guy gets a hold of us, then we follow suit with what happened with James. And so they gathered together to pray for Peter. But they don't just pray. It's, it, it, uh, they don't, John Mark, whose house that they're in, John Mark doesn't start a WhatsApp group, right, and add all of them to it and then say, okay, hey, we're going to pray for each other. Or, hey, hey, guys, uh, just lifting up Peter today, could use some prayer, going to have his head cut off. And then, you know, nine people send prayer hands and seven people send the heart, you know, emoji. And, you know, uh, three or four people put that uh, ar- that group on archive and then mute, you know, like an uh, eight hour mute. I'm busy. I got a lot going on. Can't handle all these notifications coming in. That, that's not what this, what this is. What this is, is it's a group of people that have gathered fervently and persistently to pray. So what's that mean here? This is the, the word that Luke decides to use here is so specific. It is so interestingly specific here. It actually derives from a medical term, ectinos, and it's a medical term describing the stretching of a muscle to its limit. The stretching of a muscle to its limit. So if you take that picture, why did Peter choose to use, or why did Luke choose to use this word? He could have used a a different word that meant a different thing, but he used a medical term to stretch a muscle to its limit. He uses this word in one other place. 
when he's talking about Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, verse 44, uh, Luke says, And being in agony, this is Christ in the garden right before he's arrested. Being in agony, he's deeply distressed and anguished, almost to the point of death. He prayed more and intently. Intently is coming from that same verb. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. With the same stretching, the, the, the maximum stretching of a muscle, the stretching out, the giving it of your all, to, in a painful, painful way. The same way that Christ is doing this, as he's talking to God saying, does it have to be this way, God? Okay, fine, then your will and not mine be done here on this earth. And, and the stress that his body went through caused the blood to perspire from his pores. That same amount of intensity, that in, same intent prayer was being done by these uh, Christ followers, by the church in the upper room of John Mark's house. It's not a, a WhatsApp group. It's a group of people that are earnestly, honestly giving it all they got. They're just giving God all they got for the sake of Peter. You know, we, we wonder, I wonder in my own life, why sometimes my prayers don't get answered. And sometimes it's not God's will. Sometimes I pray for dumb things, and I'm really glad God didn't answer those prayers. But there are prayers where I wonder, why is this not getting answered? See, what... We do care about what we pray for, even if it's in passing. You know, if someone sends a message and says, hey, pray for so-and-so, they're sick. You know, we've become desensitized to a lot of that. And because we're desensitized to it, in our, we're like, okay, yeah, I do want to pray for that person. I hope that they get healed. I hope they get better. But then we're right back to work. We're right back to doing what we're doing. And I don't want anyone to feel condemned or judged for any of that. That's just the way that life is. But we don't have to stay that way. But we wonder why maybe sometimes our prayers don't get answered. I, I, I think that based on this verse and based on this, this scripture here is maybe they're not answered because we don't, we're not praying fervently for it. We're not praying earnestly for it. We're not doing that thing where we really like outstretch our arms and outstretch everything that we have to say, you know, God, please, you know, please come through here. Please do this. You know, we're we're not giving God that kind of uh, intent and that kind of just all of us and all of who we are. And maybe that's why God's not answering a prayer. I'm not saying that 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 is why he's not answering a prayer, because prayer is not based on works. It's not based on, uh, on, you know, you don't have to hit your head with a brick and say, God, see how serious I am about this, you know? That, that's not what it's about. But what it is about is exercising something that God's given all of us. See, fervent and persistent prayer, it is powerful. It's very powerful when we bear our heart before God and we are desperate for Him. It's bearing our heart and being desperate for Him. So James has been executed, and this group is meeting at the top of, or in the upper room of John Mark's house. And this is what's happening. They're burying their heart before God. And then they're desperate. They're desperate for Him. So I think that we get the desperate part pretty easy. God, I'm desperate for you. God, please heal. Please deliver. Please help. Please rescue. Please secure. God, please, please, please. We get the desperate part. When we take the desperate part, but we don't bear our heart to God, when we don't connect our heart with His heart, then we're kind of not tapping into all that prayer is. And we can even fall into this habit where prayer is actually this, this other thing. See, prayer is not the persuasion of a reluctant God. God is not reluctant to answer your prayers. He's not, like, he's not on the WhatsApp group. He's not having to unmute, unarchive, pin to the top, you know, open and go through. But man, these guys are talking so much, you know. That's, that's not God. God wants to hear from you. He wants it. He made you. He made you in His image. He sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you. If you have a pain, if you have a joy or something to celebrate, God wants to be a part of that with you. But what God is saying is, don't just treat me like a reluctant God that you need to persuade. Instead, bear your heart to me. Let's be open and honest with each other. Bear it to me. Talk to me. 
be desperate for a relationship with me. And that's where the power of prayer comes. And it's raw and it's ugly and it doesn't, it's not, doesn't look wonderful and holy, but it's authentic and it's real. And they were doing it as a group. I, I just can't imagine what we could do as a group, as a church here. But anyway, if the story goes on here in the next verse, that very night before Herod was bringing Peter forward, this is the night before Peter is executed. The night before. If it was the night before your execution, do you think that you would sleep well? Not a chance. But Peter's sleeping like a dream here. It says Peter was sleeping. He's sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains with two other soldiers at the front door guarding the prison. And Peter, in the middle of all of that, is, is asleep. He's in a dark, uh, you know, dingy prison with two other Roman guys chained to him. You know what they didn't have then? They didn't have deodorant, you know. And they're in this dark room, dark, dingy place. I don't think it probably smells good. And Peter is, he's, God's asleep. What, what kind of person can just go to sleep when you're facing the sword the next day? You know, when you're facing the sword at work, you're facing the sword uh, in life, you've got a situation in life where you feel like the sword is coming for me tomorrow, whether it's financial, emotional, relational, whatever it is. But you know when you're facing it because it's that thing that lays down with you at night, that gut feeling that keeps you from going to sleep. And somehow, Peter is asleep. And he's so asleep that look at what has to happen for this miracle to happen in Peter's life. Because the, remember, people are praying that Peter is set free. So in verse 7, Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared beside him, and a light shone in the cell. I like to think of the angel with like a flashlight, you know. Hey, Peter, wake up. Ding, 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 ding. You know, wake up. You know, opening up his eyelid and shining the light in there. Peter's, he's still, he's sleeping through the light. The angel, in order to wake Peter up, has to strike Peter on the side. That's how, that's how, that's how, like, at peace Peter was. Maybe, this is speculation, because the scripture, I couldn't find anything that said this specifically. But maybe Peter has a little bit of an understanding that his soul is the priority and his soul is already taken care of by the great creator of the universe, that he witnessed Christ come and walk and do ministry and, uh, and say that he's going to be put on the cross and die. Christ does that. Christ resurrects, ascends to heaven, gives the Holy Spirit a helper, and Peter is so impacted by what he saw and witnessed from Christ that in the middle of a prison, knowing that execution is coming the next day, Peter is able to take a nap. You know... We, we do have the same situation here. I know that Christ came. I know that He walked. I know that He did ministry and miracles. I know that He healed people. I know that I've seen Him do miracles in my life. I know that He died. I know that He resurrected. I know that He ascended into heaven. I know that He's given us the Holy Spirit. I've experienced that. We've experienced that here in the church. And so we have experienced everything that Peter experienced. And you could say, well, Peter saw it happening. Well, I can tell you this. I've seen God work in this church in ways that I've said. I can see God working in these people today, right now. I can, I can recall situations where I know that God was here. And I know that God was moving in people's lives. So, so should I not then also be able to sleep? I, I should, but I don't. And it's hard. I don't want you to feel condemned or convicted of that. I, I, for me, I felt inspired to think, okay, God, on my sleepless nights or when I feel like I'm facing the sword, let me remind myself of what you have done and what you've come before me and you've gone before me and done. Let, let my situation be refreshed with truth, the truth that you did die on the cross for me, the truth that you did forgive me of my sin, the truth that everything that is in the Bible applies to my life as well. Let me just remind myself of that. So going on here, the, the angel says to get up. He tells Peter, get, get up. We're going to go quickly. He says, prepare yourself. Strap on your sandals to get ready for whatever may happen. Peter, you're going to need shoes. Put your shoes on here. And then he did so. And then the angel told him, 
Put on your robe and follow me. Get ready. I think it's weird that he put his shoes on before his robe. I would have done that in the reverse order. Right? You ever try and put your uh, socks on before your jeans if your jeans are skinny jeans? You can't do it. Or socks on after your jeans? I'm the only one that thinks about these things when you read the scripture, right? You know? This is what I think about when I read the Bible. My God, why did he put his shoes on first? But the angel tells him, put on your robe and follow me. So Peter is now ready for anything and everything. And the angel says, come on. And so Peter follows him and he goes out following the angel. And he did not realize that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought that he was seeing a vision. Because how could it be real? This would be so real. Because this, this should not be happening. And when the angel came and appeared to him, the chains fall off the two guards. And it doesn't, the guards don't know what's happened. It doesn't wake them up if they were asleep. And Peter getting dressed, it doesn't draw attention to the guards that were chained to Peter. This isn't a, a, a 20 meter chain. This is, these guys are shared, and this is in shared breathing space. And the angel comes and gets Peter up, and they're just, you know, hidden to all of this. And in fact, when they then go out, they pass the first guard, and then they pass the second guard. They just pass right by. It makes sense to me that Peter is like, is this real? You know, is this, is this actually really happening? But it is real, and they come to the iron gate. This iron gate leads out to the city. This is the last uh, defense of the prison. The big iron gate. And there's no, there's no clicker, you know, to open the gate. And so the angel and Peter come to the gate, the gate that should not open. And the angel's not like looking for his keys, you know. You guys ever leave with the wrong clicker? And you're like, I can't get into my house, you know. Stuck out of the gate. That's not what was happening here. What happened here is when they walked up to it, the authority of God went before them and the gate opens up automatically. See, there is, there, there is no gate that can keep God from doing what He wants to do in your life. No, no matter how heavy the iron is, no matter how much that should be locked and shut, the authority of God can overcome all of that. And so they come to this gate and it opens up of its own accord and it swung open for them. And then they went out. And they went along one street, and at once the angel left him. And then when Peter came to, to his senses, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel, and he's rescued me from the hands of Herod. And here's how we know that two groups of people wanted, wanted him dead, and that Herod was leveraging the Jewish people to do this. Because even Peter says, I know that he's rescued me from Herod, and from all that the Jewish people were expecting Herod to do to me. Let me show you how significant this is here. Look, look at what Herod had at his disposal. So you've got Herod here. And, and this is all for Peter. So Herod has got guards. He put, he put 16 of them on Peter. He's got prisons. A prison with a big iron door, with a big iron gate, with inner dungeons. He's got, he's got authority to do anything he wants to do in those prisons. He's got authority over any person. He is the king the king of the Romans, the king of the Jews. He's got Jewish support. He's got Roman support. He's even got his own sharp sword or an executioner that carries a sharp sword. Herod has everything that he could possibly need or want. He lacks nothing to do whatever his will would be to do. And then on the other side, you've got the church, which is a group of people sitting in the upper room of a house. And they don't have guards, prisons, soldiers, chains. They don't have authority. They don't have Jewish or Roman support. They don't have their own swords. They don't have anything. But they have one thing, and it's the only one thing that they need, and that is prayer. See, Herod could have this times a million more, but all that they needed was this one word here, was prayer. That should be an unbelievably eye-opening thing. I want you to just take a second. I want to drill this into your life here. Think about your life. You. you say, me? Okay, I'm thinking about my life. I want you to think about your life. Think about your situations that you're in right now. The good ones, the bad ones, the easy ones, the hard ones. Is there a situation 
that has you feeling like you're up against the sword? Is there a situation that has you feeling like you're trapped in a prison? Is there a situation in life right now that's making you think that maybe there's not hope for tomorrow or for next week? Or is there just a a long string of tiny little things that are just weighing on you, death by a thousand cuts, little bit by little bit by little bit, and all of a sudden you wake up one day and you've been so chipped away at that there's not much left of you. If, if, that, if, if you can identify that, we all have a Herod situation going on in our lives right now. We do. You know, I, if, if, if I sat here and stood quiet long enough, I could come up with like four or five of them. Then you would see a real panic attack up here. But we've all got stuff like this in our lives. But the good news is, is we also can all have prayer and prayer support in our lives. Which means that every single one of us in this room, if we chose to use it and to do it, we could say that I know that this has no authority in my life. I know that I can walk up to the iron gate and it'll just open up automatically for me. See, the iron gate can represent an impossibility. There is is no way that that gate should have opened. It is an impossibility in life. I was speaking with a gentleman after the first service. And I was describing, he was talking about the situation that, that he was in and, and we were praying together and stuff. And, and he said, you know, I'm in the place now where the only thing that can help me is a miracle. There's no way that I, of my own or my situation, can do anything. I am 100% in a situation where only a miracle can help my life. And as I was talking with him, I said, I don't want to minimize that at all but but listen it's not a bad thing to be in the miracle seat it's a hard thing to be there but when you're in a position where the only thing that can help you is a miracle then you're in a position of waiting and watching God perform a miracle in your life you know if you're in a position where where it If you can control the guards, the prison, the soldiers, if you've got a clicker for the iron gate in your life where you can hit a button and it'll go away, you're not in the miracle seat. We love hearing stories of the miracle seat, of people having these amazing miracles happen in their life. You know, how cool is it that Peter experienced freedom from prison? How cool is it that the angel came and and broke him out of that jail? But don't forget that Peter first had to spend seven days knowing that in a week he was going to lose his head. That's the part that we don't want. We don't want the seven days leading up to the desperation that needs the miracle, the miracle seat for us to sit in. We don't want that. We just want the miracle. You, you're probably, you may be in a place where you're in your seven days of, God, I'm, I've got the sword is coming. I know this thing is coming after me. I need, I need the miracle. I know that I'm, I'm in the miracle seat, and I need that to happen. We want out of the miracle seat as quickly as we can get out of it. Peter, Peter didn't. I mean, I'm sure he did, but he, he went to sleep. He accepted it. But in order for that miracle seat, you, you've got to be in need of it. And so it's actually not a bad thing if you don't have control over any of these things here. And you're in a place where you really do just have one more option. You are at your final option. You've called in every favor from every friend and tried to take care of this list, this worldly list here, and nothing's come through. You're finally, you need to accept it today. You're finally, you're in a miracle seat. But that's a seat where only one more thing can happen. And that's prayer and a miracle from God. See, I want you to know this truth here, that no measure of man meant to imprison can withstand God when he decides to set you free. No measure of man, no politic, No rule, no situation, no relationship, no iron gates, no prison, no bad manager, no bad management, no rumors, no WhatsApp groups, nothing. No measure of man can come against you and imprison you when God decides to set you free. So Peter, he gets set free. And his story picks back up in uh, in verse 12. And 
when he realized what had happened to him. He realized, I'm, I'm now free. Guess where Peter goes to first? He goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who also was called Mark. This is John Mark, John's surname Mark. And that's where many believers were gathered together, and they were praying continually. And they had been praying all night long. So Peter goes to where the church is. That's the first place that he goes to. He, you know, he's probably like, oh, I know he's excited. He's like, <laughs> you know, got my miracle, you know. He's like walking around. He's probably like, that step feels good. That step feels good. Wasn't going to take any more of those steps. And now every step, you know, feels good. I'm alive. I'm free. God has done this miracle in me. I want to go to my church. I want to let them know what's happening. And then I want us to go out and tell a bunch of people about this. So he shows up at this house and he knocks on the door. Knock, knock, knock. And he's in the gateway of the door, and a servant girl named Rhoda comes to answer it. And when she comes, she recognizes Peter's voice. And in her joy, she fails to open the gate. So she leaves him outside. So he, it's in the middle of the night, leaves Peter standing there in the dark. But she runs inside, and she announces that Peter was standing in front of the gateway. So think about that. Peter's, hey, I'm here. She's so excited that she forgets him out there. And goes back in. Peter's like, you forgot the good part. You forgot me. You know, like, yeah, I, I appreciate the enthusiasm, but the sun's coming up. Those guards are going to find out that I'm not there. Can we, can I get in here? And so then she goes, she goes and she tells people, she tells those, the church. So she busts in this door back here and she says, hey guys, guess what? And then it, 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 it tells what happens here in the next verse. In verse 15. She says, you know, guys, everybody, Peter is here. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. So they were praying for Peter's release. And Peter's knocking on the door. And they tell her that she's crazy because she says that Peter is outside. I, that to me brings me just so much actual comfort. Because it doesn't take a church of massive amounts of prayer or massive amounts of faith for God to move. You know, if they really, maybe if they really had faith that when she came in and, and she said, hey, Peter's outside, well, I would think what would happen if you really had faith is some guy in the back stands up and says, finally, he's late. You know, I've had to go to the bathroom for nine hours. Uh, Peter was supposed to come, you know, two hours ago. What did he do? Why, wh where was he at this whole time? You know, we knew God was going to do this. So why did it take so long? No, no, no. That's not their response. Their response was, little girl, you have lost your mind. But meanwhile, Peter continues knocking. Hey, guys, I am actually out here. He doesn't go around the corner and poke his head in a window and say, ooh, I'm a ghost, you know, and try and scare the guys. The ghost of Peter is here. No, he's knocking at the front door. Let me in, let me in. And when they opened the door and they saw him, they were completely amazed. They were amazed that the answer to their prayer was standing right there. See, that's, that to me is a church of real faith. And real faith has holes in it. Real faith still has wonder in it. Real faith still has even like a little bit of doubt in it. I don't believe that, that they were unfaithful. I, I don't believe that they were, uh, you know, disingenuous. What I want us as a church to take from this is, is it's okay to pray. And it's okay to declare. And it's okay to fervently, persistently take our honest prayers to God. But it's also okay to struggle with faith. It's okay to struggle with, but God, are you really hearing this? Are you really going to do this? It's okay to be surprised and amazed when God comes through and answers those prayers. But I don't want you to do like they do. The answer to, to your prayer, just like to theirs, the answer to your prayer, if it's knocking at the door, I, I want you to let it in today. You know, you may be asking God, like they did, little girl, go away, we've got to pray for Peter's release. Meanwhile, Peter's outside trying to get into the house. Do you have a prayer that you're praying for where the answer is already there? God, I, growing up, I prayed these prayers. Lord, please, it's, surely it's okay to date this girl. I mean, come on, God. You know, God, she's, you know, surely that this is fine. And God is saying, like, no, Chris, it's not okay. And I'm like, I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep praying. Yeah. 
I'm going to keep praying. And God's like, no, I've already answered the prayer. The answer is there. Knock, 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 knock. It's not okay. You know, it, so I, look at your prayers. Is, is God already answered? If he has, go ahead and let him in. Go ahead and accept it. So P- Peter goes on. Once, once they open the door here, he kind of ends the night with this. He motions to them, hey, we've we got to go inside. We've got to be quiet. And he described to them how the Lord had led him out of prison. And then he says, report these things to James and the brothers and the sisters, saying, go tell everybody in the church about this. Just go, go let everyone know. And then he left, and he goes, and he goes to another place. And now when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers who had become, who, who had become of Peter, as far as to what had become of Peter. When Herod searched for him and could not find him, he interrogated the guards and he communicated or commanded that they be led away to execution. Here's what I love about this. This is our last point here. Fervent and persistent prayers bring miracles, and miracles will always baffle the world. See, Herod and the guards were baffled. Where did this guy go? How did he disappear? But he did. And that miracle baffled the world. And so I want to leave you with this question here. We can baffle our world. We can. We could baffle the southern suburbs. We could baffle our communities. We can, we can baffle the, wherever it is that we, that we extend our world into. We can do that through miracles that come through prayer. So if you have in your possession today one person beside you or one other person in your life, please hear this. You can come together. You can pray. What are you going to do with your prayer today? What could you do? What could that be? Let's just pretend that if two or more of you gathered to pray this morning, that it just God will do a miracle in it today. And he'll, he'll come through for that today. What would you do with that prayer today? Now, I want to give you that opportunity in this service right now. Uh, when we step into this time of worship, you're going to have an opportunity to pray. You can stay in your seat. You can get on WhatsApp and ask somebody to pray with you. You can come down front. Down front, we're going to have some people standing there. They're really nice people, I promise. Come down front and pray with one of them. Don't pray alone. Pray with somebody. Grab the person next to you. Go to the back of the room. Whatever it is that you need to do, if you could pray, what would you do with that prayer today? See, the disciples of Christ chose that what they were going to do with their prayer was release Peter from prison. They were going to align their hearts with God, and God did a miracle, and it baffled the world. We could, we could have some world-baffling miracles right here in this room today. But don't focus on the miracle. Focus on your prayer. What are you going to do with that prayer today? Let's bow our head and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would call everybody to you that needs to come to you today. I pray, Lord, that everyone would just um, hear your voice and would respond. Lord, I've done my part. I've done all that I can do. I pray, Father, that you, that the Holy Spirit, that you move throughout this room, that you open up people's hearts, you open up their minds, you open up their ears. And, Lord, I, I pray that just a powerful movement of realization just moves through this room, that everyone realizes and grasps the idea that, If I pray today, I've got this superpower within me, and that is enabled by you, Jesus, and your love and your promises, that if we pray, God, you listen and you respond. So, Lord, I pray for courage this morning. I pray for courage and conviction for people to take their miracle seats and their miracle moments to you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.